So how many GIS professionals out there when they meet somebody at a party or wherever and they get asked what they do for a living, most all of them will say, I make maps or I work with something that's just like Google Maps. And so we are prolonging that image. And so one of the first things when I started realizing that was I changed my elevator pitch. So now when people ask me what I do, I say I help people make better decisions with the power of location. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel, and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. My guest on the show today is Adam Carnell, and he is a community evangelist over at Esri. And today on the show, we're going to be talking about the underutilization of GIS and what the cure for that might be. Adam is also going to share some ideas about rebranding, moving away from the image of map makers, and perhaps where we should be heading when we think about the way we talk about ourselves, our work, the value we add as geospatial professionals. Just a quick shout out to a podcast listener here in Denmark. CERN, thank you so much for taking the time to introduce myself and the podcast to the geospatial community here in Denmark. I really appreciate it. And if you're listening to this on your drive to work this morning, I will be reaching out to you very soon on LinkedIn. I've got a small token of my appreciation I would like to send to you. Thanks again. Okay, let's get on with the episode. Hi, Adam. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much for taking the time to do this with me. I realize that Esri is incredibly busy right now helping out with the pandemic, and you are a community evangelist at Esri. So I'm thinking that you've got a lot of interesting thoughts on GIS, on geospatial in general, and we're going to jump into those very shortly in the podcast. But before we do that, perhaps you could just take the time to give the audience a bit of an idea of your background. Sure. And thanks to you, Daniel, for this opportunity to support uh, your your podcast and your community. So uh, I'm, I'm very, very proud to be a part of it. I've been a GIS practitioner, professional GIS practitioner for uh, over 25 years. I have a bachelor's in geography and a master's in urban and regional planning. Um, I am currently at Esri Community Evangelist. I've been with Esri about 11 years, um, but I have also been in the public sector and the academia as well. So I pretty much have a well-rounded uh, set of experience, experience applying GIS across a lot of different types of projects. And my work at Esri work focuses on um, developing the community. And, and most, most importantly, I, I deal with the non-technical side of GIS and, and working with, with people to maximize the ROI on, on their investment in GIS by working more on the business management culture side of GIS. Thanks very much for that. I think that gives the, the listeners a really good understanding of, of hopefully of where this podcast episode is going to go. And you said something really important there. You said you worked with the non-technical side of GIS. And we're going to get into that shortly. But this is something that I haven't focused very much on on the podcast. I think I'm very typical in that respect in terms of being in the GIS geospatial industry. I view myself as a technologist. And there's plenty of shiny tools out there that that can distract me and, and that capture my interest. So part of the reason I asked you to come along today was to talk about that non-technical side of GIS. And the other part of it was that on your LinkedIn profile, one of the first things I saw was a, a video. And the title of this video was The Underutilization of GIS and How to Cure It. So we're going to approach this from a non-technical standpoint. And can you just explain to me what, what the, the basis of this video is? Yeah, sure. So this is a presentation I put together a few years ago, and I've given it across the U.S., and it's been recorded a few times. Um, and it's really struck a chord, I think, with most of the people that, that experience it. In my work with with customers uh, using GIS in their organizations, I repeatedly saw that the technology was vastly underutilized. And I kind of knew that, but it wasn't until 2011 I actually ran across, I was doing some research, and I ran across an article online called the underutilization of geospatial technologies. And it really it had some quotes in there that really kind of set me off. The fact that it, most of it wrapped around the fact that, that those people that are not GIS users hear the word GIS or the acronym GIS and they think MAP, those are the map makers. And so we have this image of being we're the map maker people, which is good because map map making is a very difficult vocation and it's very hard to do it really well. Um, and there's huge value in making maps. But if you have access to enterprise GIS technology beyond just the desktop, you should be doing a heck of a lot more than making maps. And so 
I saw my customers that I was working with struggling to get people to understand that they can do more than make maps and to fully utilize what they already own. And so I started really researching it and coming up with some strategies and te some techniques to help my customers get over that, that issue. And then I started writing about it in blogs and articles and presenting on it. And it just struck a chord with everybody that, that was either reading it or experiencing the presentations. And so that's when I pretty much shifted full time into being an evangelist and, and pursuing this, this full time. But it, yeah, most of what I do re revolves around a situation where an organization is underutilizing the technology and how we can get them to, um, to get rid of that. And, and it's, it's all focused on the people business culture side of it. Okay, so we're underutilizing this amazing or these amazing products we have. We have a ton of potential, as we've said again and again and again on this podcast. A geospatial location is baked into so many different aspects of our lives and so many different aspects of our work. So why are we underutilizing it? I guess this is the question. I have a feeling this has something to do with the way we we market ourselves. Is that is that getting at the heart of it? Yeah, there, I think there's a couple of things involved with it. Number one is if you're going to really utilize some enterprise uh, IT technology really well, if you're going to run a, a major enterprise IT system in an organization and get the maximum ROI, you should have some experience and training in business in corporate IT computer system, enterprise IT system management. And most GIS professionals don't have that. They have a background similar to mine, where I have a background in geography and planning. I have no business background. I have no IT system management background. So therefore, you're not prepared for the role that you're actually should be portraying. And I think this goes to another thing in that I think the most GIS manager, the GIS manager position is actually broken because if you look at a job description, for most GIS managers, they're looking at someone with a bachelor's in geography and so many years of experience and then a bunch of technical capabilities. And if you're a good GIS manager that you're going to spread the technology as far as you can through the enterprise, that's not the resume or the what you want. You want someone with, again, business um, background. You want someone with an IT management, system management background, someone that knows about digital transformation and innovation, et cetera. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is that we are part of the problem in portraying that we are map makers. So how many GIS professionals out there when they meet somebody at a party or wherever and they get asked what they do for a living, most all of them will say, I make maps or I work with something that's just like Google Maps. And so we are prolonging that image. And so one of the first things when I started realizing that was I changed my elevator pitch. So now when people ask me what I do, I say I help people make better decisions with the power of location. And if you do that, you get a very different response than if you say you make maps, because otherwise people are like, oh, okay, well, when I need a map, I'll come to you. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess if you're wanting people to do more than just make maps, then that yeah, you know, yeah. This is never going to work because we are the map makers, like you were saying. And if we're, I, I'm a thing. I think too, if we're going to grow within an organization, if geospatial GIS professionals are going to grow, you know, career-wise within an organization, they need to be more than map makers. Part of that is, I think, rebranding because the term GIS is synonymous to map maker. I think part of us jumping this chasm and and being this this true enterprise solution provider um, is to rebrand. And if you may, if you think about it, it makes no sense whatsoever that someone or a, a department has the title GIS because a, most departments and organization are titled by what they do, what is their function, not the tool you use. If you think about it, GIS is the tool we use, but it's not what we do. So like you don't see a spreadsheet department in an organization, right? So why do you see a GIS department? The GIS department sh should be named for what it's doing. Maybe it's spatial analytics. Maybe it's location intelligence. Um, maybe it is cartography. Whatever it is, it shouldn't be that. So I think part of getting people to recognize our value is, number one, getting out and being proactive and showing that value, but rebranding ourselves, changing our elevator pitch, et cetera. 
Okay, so I'm completely with you on this idea of, of rebranding, and I'm completely with you on the idea of we need to be significantly better at communicating the actual value that we that we bring to an organization, that we bring to a business or a community for that sake. But w- what about this idea of that we're not, that we're poorly prepared for the for the management side of things? Do you think this because that this comes from that a lot of us uh, come through with with perhaps a more environmental focus? And then we get into GIS, geospatial, and then we move on out, out into organizations. Why, why are we not prepared for, for managing an IT department? Well, I think that, I think you're right. I think the majority of GIS people, GIS professionals come out of the liberal arts and sciences side of things. But I also think, again, it's because the executives aren't understanding the value of the technology. If they, if they did, then the job description for a GIS manager would be very different. It wouldn't be somebody that with a geography degree and a bunch of technical desktop skills. It would be someone akin to an MBA or in, an, in a, in a um, public agency, maybe an MPA, a master's in public administration, or maybe even a master's in IT management, IT system management. So I think that what, I think that what really caused this was the evolution of the technology. So the GIS manager job description you see now is written for what it was 10 or 15 years ago. But then, especially with the cloud and with the advances in mobile technology and bandwidth, you know, it's gone from the days of where you had a GIS department where if somebody needed a map or some sort of spatial product, they went there and those GIS professionals did it and then delivered it back. Um, that has changed where now if you're a GIS professional, you can do some advanced analysis or cartography or data management on your desktop. And then in a few clicks, share it out to anybody to use directly on any device, anywhere at any time. And so your function is no longer to do all the GIS, but to make everybody GIS users and simply provide the back end and the more advanced um, technological um, needs, take care of those. So, that has happened and that's done and has been going for several years, but the job descriptions haven't changed and the people high up have not understood the full value they have hidden in, in their GIS. Not that the statement makes any of those things right that you're saying, that not that it makes them okay, but don't you, do you think this is typical to our industry? Don't you think that's like this in many industries where we see people start off and it's the technical skills that get them in the door, that get them that entry level job and then they grow with the position? Is this something that we're uniquely struggling with in the in the ge- geospatial world? No, I think it happens all the time. I think that I came out of school and I got a job as a, as a GIS analyst, and you know I, I was good, and I moved up to senior analyst, and then I was a project manager, and then the next thing you know, I was a I managed the GIS department, and I had no management training whatsoever. Like I didn't know anything, and you talk to any GIS manager, actually any manager in any any field. And I bet it's the same thing. I mean, rarely, I think, are people that come out of a a, a lower job or a technical job that move up because they're good and they can communicate or whatever, and they're successful. Next thing you know, they're a manager and they never got any management, you know, training whatsoever. Uh, I think it's a a problem in, in many industries. I don't think it's unique. Okay. So, so we've got this problem. We've got a problem where we're not very yeah, you know, on, on general, I should say, in general, we're not very good at marketing. We're not good at presenting ideas. We're not really great at communicating the value that we're actually bringing to organizations. And then on the other side, we're we're poorly prepared for these management roles that we eventually find ourselves in. So I guess my next question to you is: Do you think is this the fault of an education system that's sort of pumping out these professionals, or is this our own fault, or should we be looking at the the GIS geospatial industry in general and saying, hey, well, why is there only training out there? for for these technical things for solving technical problems using your 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 software why isn't there training out there that's preparing us to be managers there is some training that's that's out there um urissa they have a gis leadership academy that is um, five days long and it delves into everything we're talking about the business culture people side and how to be not just a gis manager actually theirs is focused on gis leader which is really what we need you know any, you know, we have lots of GIS managers. What we really need is more leaders, people who are proactive, see the value of the technology, are driven and passionate to 
get full acceptance of the technology across the entire enterprise and maximize everything, every part of it that they own and get the ultimate ROI. I mean, that is a GIS leader, a, an agent of change, people that are actually driving digital transformation with the technology and what's possible with it. Um, so there's very little leadership training other than the ERISA, and, I, and I've seen a few other things, but um, I think it's just, I, I don't think it's any one person's fault or one uh, segment's fault. I think it's just we're circumstances. We, we were this niche technology that all of a sudden very quickly became ubiquitous and is very valuable. You know, we're busy, our heads are down. We don't have the business background. I think it's just, we're, we're just experiencing the, the results of our circumstance. I'm not mad at anybody in particular. I'm just um, frustrated that so many organizations have this amazing technology that they could be using daily that could provide so much more value and, and they're not doing it. I mean, I tell my, I tell people I, all the time, I said, look, your colleagues want your help and need your help. They just don't know it. And so that frustration in me is what drives me and makes me passionate about helping people um, do more with the technology. So I guess you could choose to hear this conversation as, as being quite negative at the moment, but you could also look at it and say, holy, there is so much potential here because, you know, if there's people out there that need help and are not getting it, then I mean, there's potential, there's opportunity. So this is the other side of the conversation that I'm hearing is that perhaps you don't need to be a super coder to be involved in the geospatial industry. There's a lot of talk about machine learning at the moment. And I often hear people say, oh, you know, can I be a part of this if I can't program? And so what I'm hearing you say is that yes, because we also need these communicators, we need these leaders, and we need these, these managers, which are not necessarily in the machine room all the time. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And, you know, the more I think about it, not, to me, none of this is negative at all. I mean, the fact that you've got this underutilization is what that means is you, there's amazing amounts of opportunity. I mean, you can really do so much more for your organization and so, show so much more value and, you know, really affect your yourself personally. I mean, you can move up in the organization. You can provide more value. You can get paid more. I mean, there's a, you're in a perfect spot and this is a perfect time, especially with the pandemic to, um, to the opportunity here to, to show off what you can do. Uh, but you're right in the fact that, um, this opportunity is more for what are called, you know, a lot of people call, have called them for a long time, the soft skills, the communication abilities, the writing, the presenting, to be able to, to distill complex um, ideas down into simple terms that, that anybody can understand. You know, I've heard a lot of people, especially lately, say that, you know, those soft skills are harder to find and they're harder to teach. And actually, we need to quit calling them. Here's another rebrand. We need to quit calling them soft skills and call them essential skills. And I know that in my career, the thing that has moved me up has been those those essential skills, the, the presentation, the writing, the communication, the ability to distill complex things down into, into simple terms that anybody can understand. That geographic or geospatial communicator or translator value that is, I believe, more valuable than, than technical skill. If you can get somebody in a meeting that can be presented with a problem and then knows what data needs to be uh, brought to bear and what kind of capabilities or spatial capabilities need to be put on that data to achieve an answer that can help solve this problem and can communicate that in the middle of a meeting and then get somebody else to actually program it, that person is more valuable to me. In my day job, I, I I call myself a geospatial consultant, and oftentimes I'm called into the room, and somebody thinks they've got a problem that I can help them with. So I'm presented with all these, oh, this doesn't work, and this doesn't work, and if only we could do these three things here. And my job is never to fix the problem right then and there. My job is to is to tell them that help is on the way, is that is to communicate, well, we can do these things here. We, we have these opportunities. It could look like this. My job is to go away and understand the problem more deeply and come back with an answer. My job is never just to fix the problem. People need to know help is on the way and they need to be communicated to in such a way that they understand it. They, they're not interested in solutions right then and there. They're interested in communicating their problem and my job is to commun communicate back i understand you yeah and you know part of that 
goes to this rebranding. You know, you said it's something very important, and that is they're not interested in the technology, and they're not. And I mean, we live and breathe technology, and so we love to talk about geodatabases and, and, and spatial projections and all these other things that make people want to, you know, leave the room. Um, we've got to shift that focus when we talk to people that are not in our industry. We've got to focus away from technology and focus instead on capabilities. When you're talking to an executive, they don't care about technology, but they really care about adding new capabilities to their organization and to their workforce. So if you can instead quit talking about GIS and instead talk about the capability that GIS enables in an organization, such as a term like location intelligence, if you can get an executive to understand what location intelligence is, is achieving uh, critical insight through Use the use of spatial data to solve problems, and be more efficient, et cetera, they're all in and they're saying, okay, great. How do we help all of our employees, you know, gain this new capability, location intelligence? They'll be on board. Um, you don't even have to mention that GIS is what's providing it. So it, it's very, that's a key point in the communication breakdown or translation that needs to happen. I have a feeling that a lot of these sort of tensions that we're talking about now are grounded in the change that we've seen in the in the role of a GIS professional over the last 10 years. Could you take us back to what it looked like to be a GIS professional 10 years ago, perhaps what it looks like now and what it might look like in the future? Yeah, sure. 10 years ago, like I, like I mentioned earlier, is that, you know, when somebody needed needed some sort of geospatial product, they went to the GIS department, the GIS department got the requirements the GIS professionals uh, that were full-time and trained professionals produced that product, whether it was a paper map or a JPEG map or a PDF map or an application or whatever, and then off it went. And so that's what it was like 10 years ago. You know, it was mostly desktop, um, a little bit of internet, um, but certainly not the, the tools we're seeing today. Today, like I mentioned, you know, you're, you've got these data streams that you're managing. Um, you're doing it, you know, keeping uh, databases up to date. Uh, you're dealing with different projections and so forth. You're doing analyses, maybe creating models, and then outputting that result as a as a map service that someone then is going to plug into with whatever kind of uh, end user client that that's out there. So whether it's on their their phone or a tablet or, or a desktop or etc. So again, that shift of Instead of doing it all myself, I'm going to provide this dial tone and let, let people just use that to get their work done and collaborate, et cetera. So that's it today. In the future, I think that GIS is going to become blended into lots of other things. I mentioned location intelligence. You know, if you think about it in that that realm, it's much. It's pretty much just a, a subset of of BI or business intelligence. It's just with spatial data, and almost all data is spatial. I challenge people to try to come up with, with data that is not spatial. So, you know, a BI, a data analytics group, a decision analytics group, a data science group in an organization, they're just going to be using spatial tools for when they're touching spatial data. And then the, the quote unquote GIS is just going to be as part of the solution that's out there getting streamed to whatever devices. Uh, I, I really think that you know, there's a few technologies on on the boom now that are really going to help us be more valuable. And that is number one is uh, IoT, because every sensor has one thing in common, and that's a location. So whether it's stationary, whether it's moving, there's a location involved. So really, when you talk IoT, it's always geo IoT. So you better be um, if you've got a stream of data from some sort of IoT sensor, it better be integrated with the GIS or else you're leaving a lot of value on the table by not exploiting that spatial component. And then the other one is is AI and machine learning, like you mentioned. Where that's going, it's just going to make the these big data value, much more valuable because you'll actually be able to crunch through it quickly and be automating things. It's really those two together along with bandwidth and, and, and the hardware, it, it's just, we, we're at the start, I believe, of a, a tremendous explosion. We've seen an amazing explosion over the last 10 years of geospatial technology, but I think it's just logarithmic and it's just going to be exponential from here on out. 
I think that's a really interesting observation or thought there that it's, you know, that we're just at the start of things because, um, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago, location was the next big thing. And it sounds like it's still the next big thing. And I think it's that, that's really interesting because oftentimes we talk, we hear people say uh, that GIS is dead. And I think perhaps GIS, you know, in terms of that one stop shop GIS person, who's an expert in databases, who's also a ma- can output incredible computer visualizations, um, who can also program, who also has the, the website of things under control. I think that role there is going to be pulled apart slowly but surely, and we're going to be sort of spread out and more specialized in different areas. So I, I think that's really, really, I think you've given us a lot of hope. I guess that's what I'm, what I'm trying to say with all this. Yeah, that's my, you know, uh, I'm an evangelist. I'm supposed to be bringing hope to the masses, right? The future's so bright, we got to wear shades. I mean, th- this is the time. I mean, we're front and center, and, and especially with what's going on with the pandemic. I mean, I have never thought about the impact of something like this on our industry and the fact that the entire globe is focused on one issue united, and at the core of that issue is geography. So now is our time to shine and show value and help as many people as possible in a literal life or death situation. I mean, the spotlight is on us. It's our time to shine. The technology works. There's so much low code, no code stuff that you can crank things out very quickly and make a real big difference very fast. And I think that this pandemic situation and the spotlight on GIS is going to rocket that is going to fast forward us into the future and start some momentum that is going to really just change so many things. Okay, so if I can quickly summarize here for the listeners. So so what we've got, we've got, we're standing in an interesting time. There's a lot of change. There's always a lot of change happening. Uh, We we need to rebrand ourselves as professionals. We need to think carefully about how we talk about our industry, how we talk about and communicate the value add that we bring to the table. And and it's, it's a very exciting time to be here. So GIS, Geospatial is not dead. We're at the start of something big. This is great. Um, let, let's move off now and talk about the future. And th- this time, um, I'm hoping that you'll be able to tell us, what would you say to someone today or what advice would you give to someone today starting out in the industry? I have a feeling I know where, where we're going to end up with this, but but let's let's try it anyway. Well, number one, I would say you need to focus a lot on those soft or essential skills. So communications, writing, presenting, again, communicating complicated issues down into simple terms that anybody can answer so that you can be that geographical or geospatial translator or negotiator, whatever you want to call it. Those skills are essential. And I'm seeing more and more, not not geospatial technology related, but everything in the workplace that that those skills are of premium right now and will continue to be in the future so that's one thing number two is to think outside the box think beyond the map um, get your head out of your map and you know think more of a data scientist bi type of analytical insights things and be very aware and get involved with uh, iot and ai and machine learning and brush up on those technologies and ride that wave into wherever it can take you. And then I think anybody needs, we all are salespeople at one time or another, whether you're selling yourself to get a job or you're selling your project to the people that are going to back it or whatever. So we've all got to get business training and leadership training to be really worthwhile in our organization. I mean, if you want to move up, if you want to code and crank out the technology stuff, that's great. We need people that to do that. And and that's very hard. And we need talented people to do that. But if you really want to rise above and be a leader, you've got to really work at it. It doesn't, you don't just wake up one day and become one. So I'd say, I'd say that all of that is, is real good things to focus on. When I hear you talk like that, I have I almost get the impression that there's a really hard divide here. So either it's the, the technical track that you're going to go down, where you're going to end up you know, with your hands in some code somewhere, or it's the other way. Because it feels like we're moving towards a future of that sort of low code, no code. So either you're really deep down in it or, or nothing at all, and you're sort of more communicating and facilitating. It, do you think that would that be a fair assumption? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think the the rise of low code, no code is 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 meaning that. And that, and you know, you talk to anybody that's in technology management, there there came a point in their career where they had to say goodbye to the daily B 
being down in the trenches and crunching it. I remember distinctly when that happened in my career and I didn't really, you know, I, I still miss it to this day. And I didn't really, you know, it was, it was, it was just a tough decision. But I think that uh, the value that I get out of my professional career since then, it just dwarfs anything I was getting from the technical side whatsoever. So don't be afraid of it at all. So up until now, we, we've talked very specifically about you know individual people. What can they do in the industry? How can they improve themselves and, and go on to have really successful careers? At least that's been my feeling. Do you have any advice for... Um, for organizations, for companies starting out in the geospatial industry? Yeah. And what I would say to them is pretty much the same as what I said about people is, you know, if you're going to start out in the geospatial industry, you know, plug into IoT, uh, make sure you're utilizing AI and, and machine learning and learn how to slice through some big data because that's where the future is. Low code, no code is, a, and with cloud, it's, there's a much lower entry. So there's there's more of us that can get into the, create a new business in the geospatial industry, but latch on to the fact that I think most organizations have spatial data and are not getting the full ROI on what they already have. So just helping them do that is, is huge value, let alone buying something new. Adam, I really, really want to thank you for taking the time today to talk us through your insights into the industry, how we can improve, where we might be heading, and what the future might be might look like. I, I really appreciate the conversation. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Before I let you go, where can the listeners go to to reach out to you? Well, they can find me on LinkedIn um, for sure. I'm very active on LinkedIn, um, so reach out to me there. Uh, and then on Twitter, uh, I my my Twitter handle is at spatial. ACE, so S-P-A-T-I-A-L-A-C-E. And then if you're an Ezra user, you can find me on GeoNet, blogs and articles, etc. Thanks again, Adam. I'll be sure to include links to the to those places in the show notes. Excellent. Thanks again, Daniel. Wonderful uh, opportunity here. I really appreciate you reaching out and making this possible. And hopefully I can do a good job of supporting uh, your podcast and your community. Thanks again, Adam. I really hope you enjoyed the conversation with Adam. I certainly did. The only problem with a guest like Adam is they share so much great content. I, there's just no way I can pack it into one podcast episode. So what I've done is I've started a email newsletter which goes out once a week. So this will accompany each episode that I publish and it will include all the resources, tips, links, that kind of thing that were mentioned throughout the podcast episode. I thought this might be an easier way of getting this information to you. If that sounds like something you might be interested in, go to mapscaping.com slash podcast and you can sign up there. There's a couple of different options. Just choose the one that fits you best and yeah, I'll send those emails out to you each week along with the list of resources. If I send you an email, you could read it whenever it suits you and you could also reply. So this could be a way that we could communicate together. Anyway, again, if this is something you might be interested in, go to mapscaping.com slash podcast, sign up for a, an email newsletter from me and you know, feel free to reply. I'd love to hear from you. And that's it for another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel. It's been an absolute pleasure being your host again this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, you are more than welcome to reach out to me on social media. Just search for Mapscaping or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Thanks again. We'll talk again next week. Bye.